I'm Brandon Hopkins, uh, Assistant Research Professor at Washington State University. And I'm Brian Ashurst, uh, beekeeper here in Southern California in the Brill Valley. I'm always hitting them up for, for help in doing in these bee projects and yeah, bugging them. And I appreciate Brandon's approach to a lot of this because I think he looks at it in a real world, um, what the beekeeper really is looking for and what he needs. My great grandfather was the one who got started. Him and his son, which would be my grandfather. Then my dad and my uncles, and now me and the cousins, and, and now the fifth generation's uh, going right now too. They're buying out the third generation. <laughs> We built our first building in 2012. Came out of the necessity for a spring project that we do for making up new hives. And when we built it and got it all working, then we decided, hey, there's other uses for this. So we actually use this room almost year round for something. Right now it just happens to be the brood break thing. I think just in talking to beekeepers, researchers, doing a little thinking on your own, like how are we gonna control my, and then it's really Brandon was at the same exact same time was working on this thing and it was like okay this is i think something we need to start investigating so we just we just jumped in head first i'm not afraid to try things let's try it and see what happens i mean the level of record keeping that you do i think is amazing and i think probably really helped you see that whereas a lot of guys would have probably taken the bees out after that brood break and even in the first few days or weeks you know it's probably a bit scary you know to see that the the dead outs and just the the colony's smaller, weaker, and so I think one thing that's amazing is your ability to track those and see the, them surpass the bees that sat outside, and that takes time. Keep good records. You don't want to just throw all your money in one thing and you don't really know yet. You want to make sure you, it works. So we kept good records on it and kept an eye on it. When you first do it, you're like, I don't know if this is working. There's, you're going to get a lot of dead bees right off at the beginning, and you kind of feel like maybe this was a mistake. But in time, keeping watch over that, not only will the cold room surpass in quality strength and all that, but the dead stops. They, they've cleaned out all the poor bees. Now you're just left with the good stuff. These bees here came out of uh, our east room, we call it, last night. So that's after three, 18 days. So that's right in the center of the hive. There's no eggs, there's no, no larvae. You see anything there? Yeah, so I mean, to me, you can see why this it would be, especially the first time doing it or something like that, a little bit troubling. I don't think you see the, the big benefit until January. When, you're, when the bees finally kick back into gear and it's time to get ready for the spring, that's when you really see it. Like, they, they just take off. Those bees that had to deal with that environment outside, it's hot, they're dealing with that, they're dealing with more pesticide exposure, and they are also just never had that reset. They never got cleaned up. So because of that, by the time you get to January, those are all my lower grade hives, where the ones that come out of the coal room, they are consistently top notch, go to the producers who pay, the, pay, pay for good quality bees. It's hard to imagine Varroa mites developing resistance to this practice of brood break because it's a management control, it's not a chemical control option. You still have all the same choices of chemical control after the brood break to control mites. Using rotation of chemicals after a brood break would be a good choice. I think it also has the benefit of really reducing the amount of miticides beekeepers have to apply in the hive, which benefits the health of the bees and reduces the likelihood of developing resistance. If you only have to use a single application, after the brood break. It's a lot better than applying three or four rounds of that same chemical or applying a long lasting compound in a strip form that's in the hive for two months. So it would greatly reduce the chances, I think, of varroa mites developing resistance by utilizing this. Here's a mite on this bee right here. See, there you go. And that's why we'll treat one more time. There's a mite crawling around on this bee. So yeah, and there's nowhere for those mites to hide. And so you come through with a treatment and it's going to be 97 percent or better effective and it's going to be super consistent among all these hives you don't have to worry about them being at different levels of brood and different levels of effectiveness the treatment will be consistent when you're in a hot climate some of the new things they're working on are acids it's too hard on the bees so we have to have another alternative besides some of the other traditional methods of treatment 
Um, so I think that's another benefit that you don't even have to worry about temperatures and acids. So when they go in was a little bit of a trial and error. We didn't really know when to put them in. We started off with just a little bit of hives and, and, and seeing what they would do. And uh, we put in older parent colonies, we put in package bees, put in singles, we put in all sorts of stuff. From that we learned package bees do awesome with doing this by the way. But the parents are the ones that show the most pressure, my pressure, they have the most viral loads and all that. So I crafted it to, okay, only those bees are gonna go inside the room. And then we started looking at, okay, what time frame works the best. We've gone as late as uh, bees coming back from Montana. We put them in in like uh, late October, just to see what would happen if we did that versus earlier on. And what we kind of fell on was, so we do it in, in three rounds. So it's July, 18 days. Now you're in August, 18 days. And then you're in September, 18 days. If I could do it in one big, one time, I'd probably do it all in August because you got to catch it before the mite is actually really getting to going. Right? You want to catch it right before that. And then if you can stop it right there, I think then that breeds into success. You go too late in the year, they can't recover from the cold room. They just don't have time to get going again. So there's a, there's a sweet spot in there you got to find. We settled on 18 days because at one point we were thinking, oh, it's got to go 21 days. Well, 21s can easily turn into 25 because it's the weekend, it's the storm, whatever. And what we found is you know, 18 days seems to be about right because after that, I think all that brood comes off and they just start eating everything up in the hive. And so then when you bring them out 20, 22, 23 days, they're getting pretty light. But 18 days, you still got plenty of time. There's enough weight to get more feedback on them and get them, get them going again. Yeah. The reason why I think 18 days works is that those bees, when they get in that uh, cold condition with no food, no light after about a day, I think they cannibalize any of the eggs and even maybe some of the the youngest larva and only rear and hatch off the older larva and capped brood and so that's why you know you get almost completely broodless in less time than a full brood cycle so i don't think they're rearing and hatching off the eggs when they get into that condition and that's a big difference i think between the wintering of indoors and this brood break at times not in the winter is people have said you know they may lose, eat like a pound a week or something like that in the winter but it seems like in there, they're eating like a pound a day or more. I mean, they go through a lot of food when they're in for that 18 days. Well, if you were in the Dakotas, you would be broodless going in. So you've kind of already got the hive in that hibernation winter mode. Here, we're actually stopping it right in the middle and saying, hey, no more brood laying, we're gonna just force you into it. But there's still brood in there. There might be six, seven, eight frames of brood and that's gotta hatch and those bees gotta eat. We will treat them before they go in to try to clean up anything we can before it goes in. Um, we used to feed, and then we realized, well, they're not doing anything. They're just sitting there, and we don't need to do all that. So we stop feeding. We don't do any feed anymore before they go in. We make sure they're heavy. We pull all the honey. Everything's done. They're all filled in. They're graded. Uh, if it's not good enough to go in the comb because it's not going to survive, they get separated out. Only the strong, only the heavy. They're the only ones that can go in. And we do all this early in the morning because it's hot in the day, bring them in. Everything that gets sorted out goes into its own location. And now we work them differently. We might start combining them, requeen. Just, it's more like a hospital yard. Um, everything else uh, gets to go in here and get its, get its reset. So it'll be warm outside, of course. It's, I mean, it could be 115 in the day and it, at night it's still 105 degrees. And even if the, in August and the humidity starts coming up, so you're dealing with all that. Trucks will come in at night. We don't even put full loads on the truck because that's just more heat created. My guys, we, I'll send more trucks than I actually need to send, but that way we can go maybe just too high, kind of space them out on the truck, give them that air movement you know, for, for as they come in, because the movement itself is a stress. When we bring them in here and you put them inside, the room temperature shoots up, of course, and now you got to bring it back down. You need a lot of horsepower to keep pushing that thing down. And once you can get it down and under control, then the bees finally give up and say, okay, this is what it is, it's cold. Then they'll move into a cluster and uh, they'll, they'll just accept it. So tonight when we come in to get them out, um, or any night we get them out, it's still warm here. So uh, as soon as the door opens, the bees are like anxious to get out. They've been cooped up for 18 days. Uh, they're ready to go. They start coming out of the box. 
Uh, I'll have a guy there just watering everything down, just to keep trying to keep everything cool. We have water tanks in all the trucks, and so when they set the bees down, they'll water them again. Part of that is let everything get soaking wet, let there be water left. When the morning they wake up, they're gonna go looking for water, right? If there's already some water just on the hives and boxes and all that themselves, that helps give them some water right off the bat. Yeah, it really makes sense in this case, because it's still, what, like 90 out or something right now? Yeah, at least, yeah. yeah. So having that water is, yeah, a really good idea. Yeah. They get them loaded up as quick as they can. Same deal, we don't put too much on a, on a load. We try to keep it a, a low level load. There was a story of a beekeeper who did this and put the bees on a truckload and moved them a couple hours from the building and that had not great results. And it could be because it left half the bees on the road. I don't know, but it might be a good idea not maybe to move them long distances right out of the building. That guy had asked you, did they move them in the morning? Yep, in the morning too, I think. Okay, so we do all our moving at night. Everything's, it's sundown, we start and we go all night. The reason we do that is just for, I don't want any sun, any light, they go for it. And yes, we're not going two hours. We're gonna go 45 minutes the farthest trip. We get to the field, we'll set them down. The next day, they're gonna be flying like crazy. They start kicking out more dead. There's gonna be a lot of dead bees on the ground, but don't worry, that's just the bees that died naturally. The hive will be weakened. They'll be dead. There'll be queenlessness. There'll be, there'll be some issues. Okay, so there's a weaker one, right? That one took a little bit of a hit. See, there's another weaker one. They'll be picking that up. And you know, I do think some of it is, they could have been queenless or about to go queenless. Unfortunately, these, these are older queens. You're gonna have some that just, they're not gonna survive it. And so uh, they might be strong the day you put them in, but this is what accelerates and exposes the issues. And so you're gonna have some of that. The thing with this process is remember this, it doesn't save hives, it just preserves hives. If it was gonna decline in the field, it's gonna decline in here and it's gonna happen fast. So it's a good way to just kind of filter out those problem hives right off the bat, get them out of your way. What it does for me is it saves money because now I'm not feeding bees that are actually just on the decline. Yeah, I think you're one of the first ones that told me about that idea of it killing off these bad bees and that, that being okay. And it, it did make me think, I hear a lot of guys that they're out there and like, oh, well, we'll give it a chance. Or, you know, this thing's like four or five frames of bees and put a new queen in it and give it a chance. And, and that those bees never make it. And then, yeah. you, and then you put all that money of a new queen in it. And you put the sugar syrup in it and the mite treatments on it and the, the foul brood treatments and everything else on it. And it's still gonna die. It's yep. not gonna make it, so. Everything that will survive now will be broodless. Uh, it'll be in a smaller state. We'll come back three, four days later we want to get a treatment on, we want to get a shot of feed into them to kind of get them going again. All we put is uh, syrup though, we don't use any pollen. There's no baby bees at this point. Check to see if the queens are laying, and usually she's laying right away. There's eggs here. There's a little bit of eggs in there? A little bit of eggs okay. here. The bees in here are all young, fuzzy, healthy looking bees. Right, like you don't see, I don't know, you don't see those old, greasy, shiny looking bees in here. We don't worry about it for another two, three weeks, then we come back and now we put it on our regular schedule of feeding, a regular schedule to keep the hive going. And all you're doing right now is, let's see where it goes. And so uh, our history tells us that a lot of dead up front, maybe a fair amount of dead the next time, but then after that it stabilizes and it pretty much goes really well after that.